All right, looks like we're recording. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to this webinar on Pollinator Education Toolkits. Elaine Evans, I'll um, invite you to introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. Happy to be here. Thank you, Andrea. Um, uh, my name is Elaine Evans. I'm an extension educator at the University of Minnesota, and I specialize in pollinator conservation. So I also work as a researcher at the University of Minnesota Bee Lab. And one of the projects I've been working on are these pollinator education toolkits. Anybody um, who, um, who was watching TV in the 70s will recognize the, the GIF animation that I have there from a shampoo ad where um, they told two friends and they told two friends showing the exponential growth of what can happen when you talk to your friends. And that's part of the idea behind the pollinator education toolkits. So we know that, especially in Minnesota, there's a lot of people who are concerned about pollinators. There was a survey that found that 87% of Minnesotans were concerned about pollinator decline. This was a few years ago, so it might be even more now that awareness has grown. And because of that, there has been a lot of demand for um, public education about pollinators. And it's currently more than can be met by the, the current slew of kind of specialist pollinator educators. So the idea with these toolkits is that we provide tools for, um, for other people who, who may not be specialized in pollinator education to, um, to be able to teach others about the importance of pollinators and what we can do to help them. So these pieces are meant to be kind of standalone, but it always helps to have some background. So the idea for today is going through the different pieces of the toolkit to show you what's there and give you a little bit of, of, of background on um, what's going on with these different pieces. This is a project that is supported by the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. It's part of our Pollinator Ambassador Project that we've been running at the Bee Lab for a few years. So we're excited to add these toolkits in. And it's been a cooperative, cooperative effort between the Bee Lab as well as um, Monarch Joint Venture, the Xerces Society and Pollinate Minnesota. So the goal for today is to introduce you to these tools that you can use to spread the word. And I'll explain more about them, but there's pieces that are available online as well as, as physical pieces. And there are um, options to sign up for either of those or both of those. One piece that uh, we, we have is this um, habitat assessment guide, which I have the picture there and I have one in real life also. And um, these are uh, designed for assessing yards, gardens, and parks for how well they're supporting pollinators. And there are these different sections that you go through here. And the idea is that you're able to do an assessment of the area and you might see things in the assessment where you're, there's likely to be things where not everything is perfect. There's things you can do to improve. So the idea is you'll be able to assess your, the habitat and then find ways to improve it and do another assessment and, and see how you've improved. So the main sections are foraging habitat. A lot of people are aware of, of flowers that pollinators need. And it's, it gets into a little bit more detail than just how many you have, but in general, more is better but the, it gets into details with the, um, the type of flowers that you have, the season that they're, they're covering, um, all of those kinds of pieces and the particular kind of pollinators that you're supporting. There's another section that's on nesting and overwintering habitat. This is a piece that's not always at the forefront of everyone's mind, but besides things to eat, pollinators need places to live. So there's details in there to help you figure out how to have your pollinator garden and, par and you know parks that you're trying to increase the pollinator um, value of those that you can um, get nesting and overwintering habitat as part of that. 
pesticide practices is another really important piece. The basic thing there is, is keeping things free of insecticides, fungicides, and herbicides, but it does have um, situations, you know, understanding of situations where you might need to, for instance, use herbicides to control invasive plants that are preventing your native pollinator plants from establishing. So there are, um, it does have that kind of complexity that can be in there with pesticide use to really create the best habitat. Another section that we added in, because this is a habitat assessment guide for yards, gardens, and parks, places where, where people are really a part of that landscape, is to have community action in there. So there's also an assessment of um, what you're doing to welcome and engage not just the pollinators, but the, the human communities that are around where you are. This habitat assessment guide is one of a series that have been put together by the Xerces Society. The Xerces Society is a nonprofit that focuses on invertebrate conservation. So they do have one that is just specifically for the rusty patch bumblebee, which is an endangered species, uh, one we're familiar with here in Minnesota, our, our Minnesota state bee. But that is a really great guide for trying to really help that one specific pollinator species. They also have ones for, for different landscapes, for, um, for farms and agricultural landscapes, for natural areas and rangelands. So those are available on the Xerces website, as is, is this one, as, um, as PDFs, if you're interested in getting those. So that was, was part of this whole project, was working with Circe Society to get that more kind of human garden focused habitat assessment guide created to help people, help pollinators. And then most of the rest of what we've done is um, are these pieces for the pollinator education outreach toolkits. As part of this funding from the Environmental Nat and Natural Resources Trust Fund, we're able to produce 200 of these kits that will be distributed to educators throughout Minnesota. They'll also be available for checkout through interlibrary loan. So these are, are free and they are reusable. You know, we do have that limited number, but we are planning to have them available at extension outreach centers as well as through interlibrary loan. So hopefully more people can get those physical kits. We've also been working, um, especially since everything that's been going on with the COVID-19 pandemic, to try to get as many of these components to be virtual as well. A lot of these components are, we designed them to be interactive, so we're, it's still taking some brainstorming to figure out how to turn these into the, into the virtual world. But we do, starting in June, we had pieces of these, of the toolkits up. And so there is, um, is a form you can fill out and those are available to anyone. So we're not limited to 200 with that. We can let um, anyone that signs up can have access to these virtual components. So as we go through, I'll kind of let you know where things are with these different pieces. The first piece that we have is called, how are the pollinators doing? This is a question that, that we get a lot, that a lot of people working with pollinators, you know, I mentioned people are concerned and, and people just ask, how are the bees doing? How are the pollinators doing? And so this is a piece that we have as a physical poster that um, with the idea that nature centers and places like that can, can have this up to, to um, share this information. And then virtually we have it available as a slide presentation. The basics of what we cover in, in this activity are giving some just background information about why we care about pollinators. So 80% of the plants our flowering plants are um, relying on animals, 80, sorry, 80% 80 of plants overall are relying on animals for pollination. And that is giving us our food as well as supporting all kinds of different animals that are relying on those flowers. 
And so our, it's not just us, but our ecosystem that is depending on healthy and diverse pollinator populations. Another piece, key piece of information in pollinator, pollinator education is understanding which pollinators are in decline. People hear a lot about honeybees, but um, with honeybees, they're actually not in decline. They do have health problems, um, but um, that, so there is a high rate of colony death which is, um, is not what we want, but we do have beekeepers that are able to keep the colony numbers stable through, um, through these beekeepers, beekeepers being able to raise more bees and replace those colonies. So honeybees are actually not in decline, but they do have health problems. Bumblebees are a group where we do know that, that there are species that are in decline. It's about one out of three species across the globe with bumblebees that are um, in decline. And it's the, the case here in, in Minnesota, the rusty patch bumblebee is just one of several species that, are, um, that we've seen the populations declining. For most of the pollinators, we don't actually know how they're doing because we, we are still learning just where they are and, and who they are. Monarchs are another pollinator group that, um, that is a little bit easier to measure because people are able to look at the area that they're occupying down in Mexico where they, they migrate down to, to one particular area and they're able to measure the outside of that area to, to get um, to know how much space that they're taking up down there every winter. And unfortunately, that area has been going down over, over the last several decades, um, at least. So, um, so yeah, adding some information to just pollinators are in decline, not all of them, um, you know, some of them more than others helps to um, kind of Help, help us figure out who needs help and how we can help them. Another key piece of figuring out um, what's going on with pollinators is, is what's causing declines. There are a whole series of things that are challenges for pollinators. There's fewer flowers on the landscape, more pesticides, parasites and diseases, as well as global climate change. A lot of these problems are interacting, which is why there's these lines connecting all the things on the graph there. And um, on purpose, we have that habitat loss and poor nutrition in the center because um, that piece of, of having um, not enough flowers to support, um, to support healthy pollinators means that they're less able to detoxify from pesticides they're exposed to. They're more susceptible to pathogens. Um, with, combined with, with climate change, they have, it's harder to, to shift to areas when as ranges change and, um, and there's, there's not suitable habitat. So, so that is really a key piece, but there's all these other pieces that, that interact to, um, to cause those, those problems. The next piece in the pollinator toolkit are the pollinator plates. And um, this is one that we have as these little um, laminated two-sided pieces for um, interactive activities at tabling events. We also have that it available as a slide show. So the um, first piece of this is just some more detailed information about how pollination happens, how pollination happens to help create food for you. So we're, what we're seeing here is a bee moving pollen from the, the um, anther of one flower to the stigma of another, and then that pollen grows down and fertilizes that ovule um, 
down there and that ovule becomes a seed, which is part of the, the fruit then that, um, that we eat later. And then the main activity with the pollinator plates are going through foods that you might find on your plate and um, looking at what pollinators are contributing to that. So, so this is uh, where the poles start. So for almonds, if there, you can participate here, <laughs> if there were no pollinators, what would be left on the plate? Would it be a full plate, a three quarters full plate, half a plate or an empty plate? So a lot of answers coming in for empty plate, a couple for half plate, one for full plate. All right. Um, Ready to end it? And yeah. then I will share the results so people can see. OK. And the answer is that it would be empty. So almonds are one of these plants that are actually 100% dependent on pollinators, on animals to move their pollen, their, their pollen to produce the almond nuts. For coffee, this is our, our next poll here. So for coffee, if there were no pollinators, what would be left um, in this cup? Would, it, would you have a full cup of coffee, a three quarters of a cup, half a cup, or an empty cup? Does it depend how you take your coffee? <laughs> yeah, how much room do you want to leave for, for cream or milk? <laughs> All right, so mostly we're looking at half cup, empty cup, some full cup. I think we can end that one. And the answer for this one is three quarters of a cup. So um, coffee flowers are able to pollinate themselves sometimes with, without any insects moving their, their pollen around, but um, insect pollination improves production by about 25%, um, which, um, which can make a big difference in terms of the, the cost and the quality of the, the coffee that's, that's being produced. And then um, we can get kind of complicated with instead of just a, a single food source, uh, what happens when we have something like a, um, a pizza, which has all these different layers to it. So um, if there were no pollinators, what would be left on this pizza? Would we have um, just the crust, crust and cheese, crust cheese and sauce or crust cheese sauce and veggies. All right, so yeah, crust and cheese was coming out ahead there in the voting, and that that is um, what we what we'd have left. So cheese, we'd have a bit less cheese. The um, a lot of dairy cows are using forage that is does rely on on pollinators at some point in time, but we'd still have some cheese. But the crust is from um, grains wheat flour, which is wind pollinated. Oh, okay. But the, the tomatoes are reliant on pollinators for the sauce as, um, as well as most of the, the veggies that we'd be 
safe in there. All right, so we, I, I think we just have, have one more of these. So this is the next one, rice and beans, which is a staple in the diet of many people. If there were no pollinators left, um, what would we have on the plate of food? Would we have a full plate, three quarters plate, half plate, or an empty plate? All right, so um, half plate was, was coming out ahead there and um, full plate was there too. So, so we would actually have our, our full plate of, of rice and beans. Um, some beans do rely on, on pollinators, but a lot of them are, are self-pollinated. Rice is a wind pollinated grain but what if we wanted to have, um, you know, spice up our rice and beans with some some salsa, with some peppers and tomatoes that we'd we'd for sure need pollinators there. Even some of the the herbs that we use are are dependent on pollinators. So the idea with this activity is we're we're getting into some of the details. Um, many people may have heard that kind of one out of every three bites is dependent on pollinators. But as you can see, there's a lot of variety in terms of, of what that means for what we're eating, what kinds of food we would have access to, and um, and hopefully getting getting down to some of the complexity to to help understand um, what pollinators really really do for us. So the, um, the next activity I have here are the um, pollinator diversity cards. And um, as it sounds, they are cards. So we have these laminated cards that we've produced um, showing a wide variety of, of pollinators. We also have this as a slideshow. And um, for this one, we want to give an overview of, of all the different creatures that are pollinating. So we talk about bees a lot. Um, they are important pollinators. They move more pollen than a lot of other pollinators because they are using that pollen to feed their young. A lot of other pollinators are just visiting the flowers for nectar and just happen to move some pollen around. That's how pollination started. <laughs> um, with flies, there are um, they get a lot a less less attention than bees, but they actually can be really important pollinators. They they are really diverse. There can be really um, high numbers of them, so they can be as as important as bees in some systems. Butterflies and moths are particularly important because they can fly farther than many other pollinators. So for plants populations that need to have their genes move across distances to maintain that genetic diversity on that landscape scale. Those butterflies and moths are really important. Wasps, besides pollinating, they're also can be really important for pest control. Beetles were among the first insects to be pollinating flowers over 140 million years ago. And um, they, they aren't super active, I mean, effective as pollinators. They're not moving a ton of pollen, but, but they are still on flowers moving pollen. Birds in Minnesota, um, we have hummingbirds that can be important pollinators. And they, um, they're they often visiting flowers that are red and um, birds don't have as good a sense of smell as, as bees do. So, so those flowers tend to not have as much scent. You may have seen things about bats being important pollinators, which is true in the deserts and in the tropics, but in Minnesota, none of our bats that we have here are, are pollinators. So I want to go through what we have on these pollinator diversity cards. On the front side, there are pictures of the pollinators 
And I want to point out that all of the photos that we used are from iNaturalist as a shout out to all the people contributing photos to iNaturalist. Um, and um, we'd like to encourage people to use iNaturalist to, to help us learn more about pollinators. On the pollinator diversity cards, we've got um, the, the common name as well as the scientific name, the approximate number of species that we have in Minnesota. And then we go through key characteristics for how to identify basic biology of how they live. We have the, the size range as well as fun facts. And so we have these cards for a wide variety of, of um, pollinators. We, hello? Oh, <laughs> we, um, we wanted to focus on kind of the, the most common ones, ones that you would be likely to see if you go out and look for, for pollinators. And we try to encourage us this by having people um, go out and see how many different pollinators they can find in their backyard or their favorite park and to share those on iNaturalist. We have a, another piece that is um, available as a poster and as a, um, as a, as a slide set that, um, is a companion piece to the pollinator diversity. And this one is um, talking about bees or wannabes. So kind of defining what a bee is and um, what some of, there's lots of other things that, that kind of look like bees or bees can be confused with. So, um, you know, letting people know that bees come in all these different colors they come in a wide range of sizes. So those two bees there are both Minnesota bees. <laughs> um, so even just in Minnesota here, we have an incredible range of sizes just in bees. And um, for, for wannabes, these are things like the flies, wasps, and moths that can look a lot like bees. And, um, and then we have, um, for the, the slideshow, we have um, a little bit of, of an interactive piece where I um, ask you to find a longhorn bee. And then um, this is the, the, can you see my arrow? Or do I need to do it over here? Oh, now I see it. Okay. <laughs> I have two screens. I wasn't sure which one to go to. Um, so this is the longhorn bee. And then we have some of the fun facts. So um, longhorn bees are a specialist bee, meaning that they mostly just visit sunflowers and asters for pollen. That's the only pollen that their young will develop on. So you may see them on other flowers for nectar, but all of their, their pollen is collected from either sunflowers or asters. Now um, I'll give you a second to look there to see if you can find the robber fly. So this was the robber fly here. They can look a lot like bees. Um, we get questions sometimes where people say that they've seen a bee eating another bee and um, we don't have any bees that do that. But these flies that look a lot like bees do. So these fly, robber flies will, will actually grab bees and, um, and eat them. <laughs> Another piece that I, I, I don't think I mentioned is we do also on the diversity cards have the, um, the active season where you would expect to see these in, in Minnesota. The next piece I wanna talk about is the um, Monarchs Mishap game. So this is a game that was developed by the Monarch Joint Venture and um, they've used it a lot in classrooms. We're taking it to, um, to have it be uh, something that we can use for uh, a tabletop activity. So this is one assuming we'll be able to, to get together at some point in time and, and have, um, have events where, where people come and um, would be able to, to play this game. We're um, gonna have to work on a, a virtual version of this too. 
but currently we just have the the um, in person interactive game the basic idea of this is is showing um, how um, what happens to monarchs. So um, monarchs are able to lay a lot of eggs, but only a small portion of those survive to adulthood. And there's all different kinds of things that can happen to them along the way from, from having ants eat the eggs to having an adult run into a car. And the idea is here we'll have a, um, a spinner and then people will be able to tally up to get to see what's happening with this with this population, to get to see um, what actually, how many actually end up surviving to to adulthood. So it's not just about um, the number of eggs that are laid. It's um, and and it's not just about you know they they need the monarch for that stage. I mean the the milkweed for that stage, but they need support through all these other stages. Um, to have um, other things to eat, to, to have um, places where they can have protection from, from some of these different um, things that can happen to them. And a lot of these are just natural things that happen. So there's, there's natural, um, you know, the things that, that happen along the way that are um, part of, of um, the population cycle. So that's one of the lessons from the, the monarch mishaps. We have a also a poster that's talking about rare Minnesota bees with some information for identification. So especially with the rusty batch bumblebee becoming our um, Minnesota state bee and be, being um, protected as an endangered species, there's a lot more people out there looking for them. But there are also a good number of other bees that can be confused with the rusty patch bumblebee. So this is to help people take a, um, a look at the different ones. The, the most common um, one that it's confused with if you live anywhere um, in the northern half of Minnesota is the tricolored bumblebee, which has this bright orange spot. And um, that is actually one of the most common bumblebees in the northern part of the state. The rusty patch bumblebee, it has this rusty patch, but it's kind of subtle. Um, but the, this is um, just information on um, helping people identify the, the rusty patch bumblebee as well as the yellow banded bumblebee, which is uh, another species that was um, recently considered for listing as an endangered species. Um, and, and it is um, definitely in, in decline compared to what it used to be, as well as um, Ashton's cuckoo bee, which is probably our rarest Minnesota bee. It hasn't been seen um, anywhere in the in the state since the um, since the 1990s. It's been spotted a couple places in the the eastern U.S., but even it's it's um, in the last 20 years, I think people have found three of them anywhere. So they are really in, um, in dire straits. Part of the reason for that is, so they are a cuckoo bee. If you know anything about what cuckoos do, they go in and take over the nests of other birds. These bees go in and take over the nests of other bumblebees. And the Ashton's cuckoo bee specializes in going into the nests of the rusty patch bumblebee and the yellow banded bumblebee, both of which have had severe population declines so um, since they can't find their hosts, these guys um, are in real trouble. Another pretty cool bee um, are these oil bees. These bees, instead of collecting pollen, they collect oil from flowers and they collect them from, from native loose stripes, Lysimachia flowers. And they're, they're a little bit tricky to ID. So mostly what we want you to do is recognize these yellow loosestrife flowers, which are oftentimes near wetlands and look out for bees that are visiting there and bees that you see with long hairs on their legs um, are, could be these guys. <laughs> if you take photos and share them with us, we could be really excited to find some new places um, for, these, for these oil bees, which have also become very rare. 
So we don't want just people to just know about pollinators. We want people to help pollinators. So we have a poster and a slide set that's based on four actions that you can take to help pollinators. The first is plant flowers. We talked about that a bit with the, um, and this, this connects somewhat with the, um, with the habitat assessment guides. So um, have some suggestions just for getting flowers across the seasons keeping them free of pesticides, also providing homes for both um, ground nesting bees, cavity nesting bees, as well as bumblebees, and providing that larval forage for caterpillars. A third step we recommend is that people take climate action. We know that pollinators are suffering due to um, climate change, things that it has done with both extreme weather events as well as, as rain shifts and habitat loss. There's mismatches with the um, flowers when pollinators come out at the wrong time with the flowers. It can be a little bit overwhelming to think about what to do about um, you know, this global situation that we have, but um, reducing the, the release of, of greenhouse gases can be done by using clean energy sources like solar and wind as much as possible, as well as the importance of supporting environmental regulations that, that help, um, help us all get there. There's a lot of talk about planting trees for um, carbon sequestration, but I want to point out that grasslands are also really important. So um, if you look at prairie plants and those all that biomass that's underneath the ground with the, the roots of those plants, that's great carbon storage. And so um, having those grasslands and also supporting sustainable agriculture can help to trap those greenhouse gases and help us um, help ourselves, the planet, as well as, as pollinators. The fourth piece, fourth action step is to collect data. So I talked about iNaturalist a little bit, getting people to get out, taking photos, sharing the iNaturalist. Bumblebee Watch is another place that's um, just focused on bumblebees, but same kind of idea where you can take photos and submit them. The um, Monarch Larva monitoring, monitoring Project is a little more involved, but um, it, you can get involved in counting eggs and caterpillars on milkweed plant plants to help um, learn about monarch breeding, biology, and distribution. Another piece connected to, to what to do specifically with gardening is the um, Pollinator Garden Buffet, which is a little game. So we've got this, the piece I'm showing there is about this size, laminated sheet that goes down. And then um, what you're able to do is um, have these cards representing a bunch of different things. <laughs> representing different different flowers and different community actions. And you're able to, to build up your garden with these cards. The idea is that you'll pick um, three flowers for each season along with some nesting habitat and community actions. And you can do this either to just kind of recreate what you know you have in your garden, or you can just be trying to, to get a high score. <laughs> so. Um, so we do have um, have just yeah the the cards that you place down for all those different things, and then um, you get points based on getting um, those those plants across the seasons, as well as supporting special things like having a bee lawn, having trees and shrubs. There's notes on these cards that are, there's these kind of codes down in the corner that let you know if you have food that supports specialist bees, or if you have host plants for caterpillars and you get extra points for all of those things. And then at the end, you can end up being a pollinator superhero a pollinator champion or a, a pollinator sidekick. If you get less than 40 points, you have to, to try again. 
And that connects directly with the, the Xerces Habitat Assessment Guide if you want to um, kind of go back and forth and, and rate yourself through, through their system as well. One piece that, um, that we're excited about too is um, a set of pollinator trivia games. So this is one that we'll be updating as, as we get new information. And um, we have it as um, in, the, in the physical kits, it comes with a, a little cube that you roll that leads you into these different categories. Um, that are on this, um, this spinning wheel. But here we have um, just a spinning wheel. <laughs> and um, so this, I think we have some, some poles set up for this. So we have um, a true or false question. Here we go. All right, true or false, most bees are black and yellow. I'm going to go ahead and end that. That's about the number okay. of people who usually vote. And if you didn't, it's okay. It's only fun. Yeah, and it was it was pretty close, but um, went over to to false. So um, there are a lot of black and yellow bees, but there's more bees that are are all kinds of different colors. And so they do come in um, pretty much every color of the rainbow, plus plus some others. We'll. Um, have a few of these trivia questions for you guys. So the next one is also a bee diversity question. And this one is, Ugh. where do most bees live? Uh oh, you're going to have to vote in the chat. This one I didn't get. Oh, sorry. I could quick um, set it up, but no one wants to watch me type. OK, yeah. <laughs> so where do most bees live? In the ground? Um, in trees, in the ground, in plant stems, or in the grass. Oh, good. We're getting some votes here in the chat. We've got B in the ground, in plant stems, ground, in the ground, ground. Okay, number of folks voting for in the ground. Oh, some votes for in plant stems. Lots of folks voting for B in the ground. All right. Yeah. And that is right. So it's about 80% of B species that, that make their nests in the ground. We've got another one here in the section that's just oh. pollinators. That one I've got. OK. <laughs> So many insects are pollinators. Which of these are not pollinators? We've got wasps, flies, beetles, or dragonflies. This one, there's a lot of consensus <laughs> so far. I went ahead and shared the results. All right. So this one is dragonflies. So um, dragonflies do not visit flowers for, for pollen or nectar. And um, they are eating other insects. In fact, they, um, they eat other pollinators. <laughs> they eat pollinators as, um, and can actually um, sometimes have a negative effect on uh, pollination in an area, depending on uh, on their populations. But that's all that's all part of uh, everything connecting to each other. We have um, a couple of other pieces that are are still in the works. These are the the main pieces that we have together at this point. We have um, a poster we're working on that are um, is talking about some of the the top myths about helping pollinators. So things that um, that 
just some com common misunderstandings about pollinators that we're, um, we're trying to address. And then um, we're also gonna have some, um, some activity focused on just the, the life cycle phenology, which, um, which is both interesting, but it also helps to, to understand what's going on with different pollinators to know, um, to know how to help them best. Like with, um, with stem nesting bees, if you're cutting back stems, when is the best time to cut back stems? That's gonna depend on their, their life cycle and their phenology. We also are gonna have a, a few other pieces that are just kind of um, GWOW kind of things where um, some, some things to show the ultraviolet patterns in flowers. So bees and some other pollinators can see into ultraviolet light and they have these um, patterns that they see on flowers that we don't see, but we're gonna set up some, some ways for people to be able to, to see what's going on. Um, how bees see the flowers, as well as um, some some things with how how flowers and um, bees have have co-evolved with um, with the depths of the tubes, with all the different depths of the the tongue lengths of bees. So there's a lot of really specific matching going on between um, between bees and their and their flowers. So, um, so yeah, that's the, the overview of, of what we've got as tools to support you to go out and, and talk to more people about pollinators. The um, information about the toolkits is at z.umn.edu backslash pollinator ambassador. And on that page, you'll see links to two different forms. So one is the application for the physical kit. And again, we only can, can send out 200. So we are, are prioritizing those kits to go out to different, different regions across Minnesota, as well as um, people who are working with, um, with underserved communities. And um, so not everyone that, unfortunately, not everyone that applies will be able to, to get one of the kits. But for the virtual kits, there's another a different form there for the virtual kits and those um, everybody can have access to and we'll be um, adding to those to we have a bunch of pieces of the virtual kit there now but there'll be more pieces being added over the next few months. And for the, the physical kits, we have about more, a little more than half of the pieces already produced, but we're waiting till we have everything, which will be in um, early next year. And then we will be sending them out. I also want to, to plug some information we've been putting together just to help support classroom teachers um, in their, their work with pollinators. So we have information for that on the B-Lab website at um, blab.umn.edu um, backslash classroom. And um, that is, um, I'll, I'll leave that up there so you can, can, can um, look at that for a minute, but I can start um, taking questions and I'll, um, I'll probably stop sharing my screen in a, in a few minutes just so that I can, can see people's faces more. <laughs> Yeah, great. Let's have if you're if you're interested, you're welcome to turn on your camera and we can just have a chit chat. We've got a little time yet. Uh, please feel free to enter a question into the chat <clears throat> or um, you can raise your hand in the participant list. I'll scroll that occasionally. Or I think um, as long as everyone's courteous, go ahead and unmute yourself and just shout out a question. Elaine knows a lot of stuff, so this is your chance to ask about pollinators in general, bees in general, or about these pollinator ambassador kits that are um, pretty cool, pretty exciting. So don't be shy. I'm just going to keep an eye on the okay chat. Can we print out the games from the digital version? Um, so I we don't have that set up now um, just because they were kind of a little bit larger scale. Um, but we've been we've been talking about um, 
you know, having them resized to a to a size that might be easier for people to print. I think we just have to figure out, you know, either, um, I mean, we we might need to leave them at the size they are, and and people would have to maybe go to um, to a printer to have them printed out on a little bit bigger mm -hmm. size. Um, I don't know. I'm kind of curious mm -hmm. if people is that <laughs> would people. Is that something people feel comfortable? Would they be able to go? Would they rather have it smaller and it doesn't work quite right? <laughs> or are people able to get I to know, the printer I, and print out the bigger size? Yeah, and if you, Laura, I know you posted that question. Um, if you wouldn't mind unmuting and telling what kind of format would be useful. I mean, maybe you'd print out seven versions of the eight and a half by 11 and then your students would work in small groups at tables, uh, assuming that ever is allowed to happen ever again, or maybe it would be easy for you to take a jump drive to a Kinko's and say, here, print this out for me at 20 by 24. What would be useful in terms of these kind of files? Well, if it was a game board, it would be um, great to be able to have multiple copies so that each team or table group could play the game. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Most school districts have the ability to print a little larger size, um, you know, 22 by 17 or one of those otherwise they could also be taken to a printer were you great that's helpful Thank that, you. Yeah, that's great. because of the oh and i love just to say i just need to say i love the monarch mishaps game you know from the unit from the monarch lab and i've used it so many times but i run out of time sometimes in the fall to do it outside so the idea of making it into a board game is awesome thank okay. you for that create creative change. Mm -hmm. yeah and that's great feedback we'll we'll um we'll do that we'll <laughs> we'll get them up there in the in the bigger sizes for for people to access them perfect great um okay elaine will you take a stab at this one about how bees survive the winter different species maybe handle it differently and how important is it to not rake leaves Okay, yeah. For um, bees surviving the winter, they um, there are um, a few different strategies. So um, mostly they are um, in their their nests as the young. So most bees are are solitary, and their mom just kind of left them on a <laughs> on a little ball of pollen, either in the ground or in a stem. And then over the summer, they've eaten that pollen. And um, you know, like now, they would be in a stage where they're they're usually a pre-pupa, so they haven't turned from a larva to a they haven't turned into a, a pupa yet. They're still a larva, but they're kind of just before they turn into a pupa. That is kind of the the most stable life stage, and they'll just be either in the stems or in the ground and um, they'll just survive the winter there and um, they'll wait till, till next spring, next summer when they um, will, will pupate and become adults and, and then um, leave their nest. Bumblebees are, are different they, because they are a social bee and they, um, for them, it's only the queen bees that survive the winter. So in the fall, there's new queens that are produced and that they leave the nest, they mate, everybody else dies, and those queens dig themselves down into the dirt, and and that's where they survive the winter. Um, and so they're they're just a couple inches down. They actually have a, um, a antifreeze, a glycol in their blood to keep them from freezing because they're they're just a couple inches down, um, and then. So they're, they're the only ones that survive and, and come out in the spring. Awesome. And then, so whether or not you rake the leaves is maybe not as much of a thing for bees specifically. Right. Um, I think it's much more of a thing for, for caterpillars. Mm -hmm. um, for um, the stems makes a difference. So for the stem nesting bees, um, you do want to leave the, the stems there for them, if um, especially if you if you think they've they've nested in them um and because they won't be coming out till till next spring um the the leaves can help kind of insulate so those the the bees that are overwintering in the ground it does help to have the leaves for insulation um 
but they're not actually in the leads. Sure, that makes sense. Okay, there's so many great questions about bees specifically. So I, I whoa. Do you have a sense for how much pollinator garden habitat in an area is needed to truly be beneficial to pollinators? That is a good question. And, and just, and I, I don't have, um, I haven't seen, you know, research. So I'm going to answer this based on more just like my anecdotal observations where seeing um, pollinator habitat, even just a little bit, um, they're really good at finding it since they are so mobile. And um, my, and I, I live in St. Paul in a typical city lot and, um, you know, have my boulevard that I turned into pollinator habitat um, almost 20 years ago now. But when I started doing it, my husband thought I was nuts because it was like, that's not going to make a difference. You know, that, that'll look pretty, but you're really going to help the pollinators, you know, with that, whatever it is, not very many feet of, <laughs> of habitat. But within two years, we started seeing so many bees, um, as well as, um, you know, goldfinches and all kinds of things that hadn't been in our yard before. So, um, you know, the one of the things about pollinator habitat is it tends to be these tall plants. So even though the the footprint of it may not be much, you're creating a lot of habitat with all that mm. architecture. That makes sense. And so for all those ground nesting bees, is there any other characteristic of the ground to make it attractive to the ground nesting bees? Does there need to be cover? Should it be wide open? What's preferable? You'll see, or I've seen recommendations for, you know, having bare ground. And unfortunately, I think a lot of that is based on just where we have seen bees, because we're more, more likely to find the bee nests when they're in bare ground. Mm -hmm. There's a graduate student, Julia Broca, in the Caravo Native Bee Lab right now, who is trying to figure out where ground nesting bees are nesting. And she does that by putting these, um, she has these mesh traps that she puts down in all kinds of different habitats oh. and then see what comes out. And she's finding all kinds of bees in a lot of different different places. So so not just bare ground, but, but <laughs> some, you know, with cover. So, so there's so many different bees that are using the ground that there's a lot of variety. So having different things, having some disturbed areas, having some undisturbed areas, having mm -hmm. some areas that are bare, having some areas with leaf cover, um, like having that variety will, yeah. will help you support the, the diversity of, of ground nesting bees. Mm -hmm. That stands to reason, I love it. And there's, so there's a few more questions here in the chat, but uh, it's five o'clock and I want to respect everyone's time. So I'm going to wrap it up. But this is such a great indication that there's so much curiosity about bees and pollinators that these outreach kits are going to be really helpful, I think, in continuing to build that curiosity in the general public, because the things that we're curious about, curious about are the things we want to learn about. We learn about them so that we can care for them and ultimately protect them. So I'm so excited to see that this is a resource that's going to be available available to so many. 200 is a lot of great kits that are going to be out in the state. And um, I know that Elaine, you're happy to serve as a resource on um, pollinator education for folks. So um, yeah. be sure. Oh, I, just, oh, yeah. I just remembered one thing that I forgot to mm -hmm. mention is that we do also have um, a series of videos up on YouTube that just go over kind of, um, so it's not so much me giving the slide presentation, but me sure. trying to give you the, all the background information you might need if you're giving this, this slide mm -hmm. presentation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like the pollinator diversity one, I ended up, it ended up being a 45 minute long video. <laughs> Just because I tried to give all this information. Um, so just, That's great. you know, we're trying to have resources that are, you know, that you can access to help support your using the resources. Love it. Love it. That's so great. Thank you for making all this available. It's really exciting. And I want to encourage everybody uh, on this call to apply for a toolkit. And um, those decisions will be made and the kits will be distributed about when. 
in um, hopefully January, February. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Well, good luck wrapping up the development of all those materials. It's a big job. So, um, but it's going to get again, each one to each one. And pretty soon, um, everybody will be a lot smarter. So thanks, Elaine. And thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Um, this webinar, should you want to share it or review it, uh, will be available on Elaine's YouTube channel. So give us a day or three to work that out. And you can um, share this with your worlds. Thanks, everybody.